Hi everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and yeah, I'm here today to introduce you to my new friend. This is my motorized electric skein winder that, well, she doesn't officially have a name yet, but this is my first official assistant, I suppose. I mean, yes, there are the chem kids and my husband, but when it comes to all things Chemnitz, basically, all of the yarn passes through my hands. And after a lot of winding yarn, I thought that I, maybe my joints could use a little bit of a helper. I just set this up yesterday and I'm gonna show you a little, show you around the device, tell you a little bit about it. Um, but as you've known, like when I do most of my skeining at this point, I use these PVC pipe nitty knotties that I made myself. And actually there's some videos on the channel on what I need, what you need to make these. And the total cost is about, you know, six or $7 for all of these pieces. And the nice thing about PVC pipe is they're adjustable. Um, I can have it in this H configuration to unravel a sock blank or I can have it in the more traditional nitty knotty setup like this. Um, and they work, they work really well. Um, but if you go, the thing I'm most curious about today is trying to use my skein winder to unravel the sock blank, which we will try in a little bit. There might be some yelps. Hopefully there will not be any swearing. <laughs> um, it goes really, really, really fast. So I want to give it a shot, um, but when we first plugged it in yesterday, I guess the the button was turned on, and so we were like, oh, and surprised. But uh, yeah, so in, in today's video, we will, the second thing we're going to do is we will unravel this sock blank that you guys have not seen yet. Um, I'm working on editing this video, and so here is this really, really lovely double-stranded blank that I dyed. And then I thought we would also just for fun reskein this yarn that actually Lucas, my almost five-year-old chem kid, uh, dyed. Um, he hand painted this with some uh, tulip tie-dye. And this is the 100% cotton, this is the cotton boucle yarn from Knit Picks. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I thought it would be fun to just reskein it. Uh, so that way, yeah, as something that's a colorful example. Uh, that we can use today. But you know, normally when I unravel sock blanks, and I guess I'll talk about this again later, um, I'll do it on here two at a time and sort of just like wind this around and around, which is fairly slow. But one nice thing about doing it by hand is that you can really see the gradient of yarn um, because you have control. And I don't think we're gonna see the unwound gradient in quite as a nice, uh, not as nicely organized, um, but we will see. So I'm gonna set these aside and I'm actually gonna pick you guys up and take you around uh, this guy. All right, so this is the skein winder. It is the triple skein winder with the counter from Crazy Monkey Creations. Good morning, everyone. And it's an adjustable skein winder. So I can wind skeins between one yard and I think 89 inches is the max that it goes to. So all of these, I don't know what they're called, parts are adjustable. But basically you feed the yarn through here and then you can clip it on. There are these like handy clips so you can clip the yarn there. And then it starts uh, when I turn it on, which I'm not going to do this close, you turn it on and it'll start winding around. And the way the counter works, it's pretty cool. Let's see if we can see. All right, there's there's a little like sensor thing there and there's a magnet. Um, I don't know if I can get over there. Okay, there's a magnet right there. Whoops. <laughs> and so it counts the magnet passing by the sensor, um, which is pretty cool. Um, as for, reminds me a bit of a spinning wheel because there's this wheel, the motor down here, the motor drives this wheel, which drives this bar, which spins this thing. I don't know, my <laughs> mechanical engineering husband thought that it was really, really cool. Um, oh, thanks for joining me from the grocery store. Now, 
Um, I chose this particular skein winder on recommendation um, from Kayleen at Little Bean Loves Yarn. Uh, and she recommended it. And I think that the Crazy Monkey Creations, um, they have a disclaimer up right now that the production time uh, can be between four and six weeks um, because due to some health issues. But I was impressed with how it was made and it took, it arrived to me in under a month. Um, so I think I ordered it on the 15th of September and it arrived on October 12th. So it is an expensive toy, probably the most expensive. Yeah, I think the most expensive things that I use now save like maybe my camera. <laughs> but I think that um, in the long run, it can be, I think that it'll help streamline some things because a lot of Sometimes with, especially like with the, um, when I did cellulose week, I got a lot of different cotton blends that came as balls. And so I had to hand wind those into skeins. And it takes, it takes a few minutes um, for me to do it by hand. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not, I haven't timed it, but eventually my arm gets tired. And so that's the limiting factor. Whereas this, um, it's a little bit scary <laughs> at first, but it did go quickly going from ball to skein. I have not really tried the fastest setting because it says that you should not on the fastest setting be hand feeding it. And I did, when it's a ball of yarn, I do kind of need to hand feed it. So um, yeah, with the three clips, yes. So I bought, getting the triple one was only a little more expensive than the single one. That's why I went for the triple because I wanted two to do sock blanks. But so if depending on how I like this, then I might end up with the, they also sell a double vertical Swift. So this is my current Swift. I'm not sure where it's from, but she's rickety. I'm not sure how she's gonna hold up to that, but that's one of the things that we will see. Maybe she will explode, hopefully not. <laughs> I have, I don't know if you guys could tell me, the, there's like random little ties because I've had to repair this in a number of times. But I'm definitely in the market for a new Swift. Um, and let's see. Um, you love these new, new bird daughter loves my voice. Oh, thank you. Yes. So <laughs> the goal, the goal of today's video isn't necessarily to convince you guys to all go and buy this. I think that um, I know that some of you have been starting up your own like indie dyer businesses, and so then something like this could be something really handy. Although I think what the community tends to recommend as the first big like purchase for dyeing a lot of yarn is like a spin dryer. Um, so that way that will help your yarns that you dye dry faster. And honestly, that might be something that I will be acquiring soon because my drying racks have been very, very full lately. But with the Hanukkah sampler, and there's still, I should, of course I'm bending down, but, <laughs> uh, um, the there's a I'm doing a Hanukkah sampler and a Hanukkah special and there's still some slots left but I realize that when I'm about to be winding dozens and dozens of mini skeins that this could really help me out and especially with the counter because when normally when I do mini skeins I'll have sorry for the squeaks the PVC pipe and I'll wind them around here and then I will either count as I'm doing it and then double check the counts and I think that one of the most attractive features is the counter, so I'm not gonna have to like double and triple check. I'll be able to like, yeah, at least that's my hope. And so we'll see. But I hemmed and hawed over whether or not I needed this for a while and realized that I really wanted it and I think that it could help me with prep that um, otherwise like I just wasn't doing or was putting off, so. Um, Oh, you're my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, yeah, so feel free to ask any other questions as well. Um, but, oh, I guess I mentioned the Hanukkah sampler. Um, for that, I'm doing eight different yarn bases, eight different techniques. A new video will come out every night. Um, so, oh, okay. Um, yes, <laughs> Sharon, I'll get to that. Um, I ordered it August 15th. It arrived September 12th. Uh, I mix up my months. Um, 
But the Hanukkah sampler will be um, shipping the first week of November. And I will be closing the pre-orders for the full skein in that package, I think, at the end of September. Um, but, yeah, that's fun. Okay. Let's find... Ah. And then there's the button. Okay. Ooh, and that was not slid all the way. So it's just a little slide, slide button. Um, and yesterday when I was doing this, I was sitting over on that side and it was a little awkward to turn off. So I'm not sure. I, I definitely will need to get the, the feel of it. But when I plug this in, I'm just going to stay back over here just in case. Just in case she's accidentally turned on. Um, <laughs> okay, she's not. So when I go with the button, it's a little bit slow to start because you can see, I don't know if you can see the button, I'm about halfway up. And okay, so that's not that, that's not that bad, right? A little scary, huh? <laughs> she goes fast. Um, and so just in that instance, that was 27 revolutions. I can't do that by hand. Um, <laughs> all right, let me get this set up so we can try it. Um, yeah, it is, it is fast. So the first time that we tried it, the button was accidentally all the way at the top and we thought that it was in the off position and we were just like, ah! <laughs> I was amused. Okay. Where is my other? Oh, goody. Can I just untie you? Um, nope. Don't feel like fiddling. So I will say, I'm not sure what will happen. My Swift is on a stool. I'm not sure if you guys can completely tell. Wait, where is the... Oh, there's one more. Fine. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell that she is just a stool, which means that um, if, yeah, if there's like a tangle or something in here, then the stool might fall down um, and I might scream, but I'm going to try to do, this is why we're going to start slowly. Um, I mean, it does like stop, but... I do think that the, yeah, let's just, I'm, I'm nervous guys. Maybe, maybe we should do the other one. Um, so this I have not tried before. Um, I have not tried doing, okay. I have not tried doing one from a skein to a skein. Um, so I'm going to just put it in. Uh, I guess you can't quite see. I put it in through one of the loops. I'm going to position this and clip it. All right, we're zeroed. And uh, let's give this a shot. And I'm going to back up so you guys can uh, see and hopefully... So you're not supposed to hand guide, but, oh. okay, something's not, oh goodness, okay, this might, uh, I don't think it's a swift issue, I think it's, um, Well, we'll see. At least that was nice and slow. Oh, too fast. Like, it's really, really easy to get it going pretty fast. <laughs> um, okay, right now this isn't bad. I could totally do this with mini skeins. It's nice that there can be like a like slow, slow speed. And let's, oh my gosh. I'm already, this is not even the max speed, and I'm already a little scared. I'm like putting my feet <laughs> against the stool. Figured that that's a good safety. It 
Again, this is not as fast as it can go. When I'm unwinding a blank, I'm not going to try going this fast. I'm a little scared. Uh, okay. I'm still not going quite as fast as it can go, but we're at the end. Oh my gosh, look at, look at my Swift. It like popped up at the end. <laughs> okay, was that wild or was that wild? Um, that's way faster than I could have done it by hand. Way, way, way faster. But I think that this, the Swift like, kind of like coming, coming up being like, it was like, Woo! I'm flying. Okay, so my, this Swift, even cobbled together, like, not great, seemed to do a good job. And, oh, funny, I didn't even check my markings. So, I'm still a little unsure with the markings I'm missing. Oh, I need to bend down. So, apparently, it's like two yard, one and a half yards, and then one yard is what I think. But then... There we go. Bring it in a little bit. Then I can bring this off. Sort of tie around and then unclip. So that part's easy. And the skein is nice. I'll show I'll give you guys a closer up view of this in a second. So we'll see. I'll, I've got a yardstick here so I can measure. But here it is reskained. Yeah, wasn't that fast? Um, I think. So here's what I don't know. When you measure how wide a skein is, should you be measuring it from the inside or the outside? Because I think I had it at where it's supposed to be like one and a half. And I think one and a half would be 36 plus 18, so 54. And right now this, at the most generous, would be a 50 inch. Um, yeah, 50 inch skein. Because it's this is 25. So, I'm not sure. This is about the size that I would get on my Nitty Nani. Um, I think that the two yard one might be a little more preferable. When I tried that yesterday, it wasn't exactly two yards, but um, it's very, very pretty. Um, yeah, because I think, so when I wind on my Nitty Knotty, I end up getting probably, uh, that might be a little closer to one and a half from um, four foot. I don't, I don't know. So it's not quite one and a half yards, even though I was at what I think is supposed to be the one and a half yard marking. The, the further, the further marking up here, okay, so this is where I was. The further marking up here, I think is about like one and two thirds was what I got. But I think that like as long yeah, I, as long as you're like consistent and stuff, I think that it's fine. Oh, and how many wraps? So there were 153 wraps. Um, and actually I could go look up. Um, okay, the cotton boucle is, so that is supposed to be 218 yards per 100 grams. And so if we had, 153 wraps times 50 inches divided by 12 inches per feet divided by three. So I just did the conversion based on like measuring the length as 50. Um, and it said that there's should be 218 yards per 100 grams. And my rough calculation based on the 153 wraps at about 50 inches a wrap is uh, 212. That's not bad. Actually, I should weigh her. Um, oh, 
Oh, Shelly, that's brilliant. I should use a tape measure. <laughs> that, that is absolutely brilliant. Okay, I'm totally gonna do that. Um, actually, I have a tape measure. We can do that in a moment. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I didn't think of that. All right, let's, let's weigh the skein load. It was weighing a package to send out earlier. Grams. Oh, is this one short? Hmm. So this is about 101.5 grams. So, you know, the measurement is, the measurement was close though, close within six yards. Like I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, what was I going to say? Let's get the tape measure and bring you guys back so I can see you. What's the saying? Work smarter, not harder. Yeah. You should have seen me yesterday as I was, well, I will say there were two scientists in the room last night and neither of us thought to just grab a tape measure. Because I think I was looking at this and picturing a circle, even though it will just come, come around. So, all right. So this is at a peg. Okay, it is saying 54 inches. Um, and 54 inches, that is a yard and a half. So I think that, I don't know if the yarn going around compresses it, or maybe the yarn is a little stretched as it's going on and then it sort of relaxes a bit, but it is the measurement that it said it should be. Um, so thank you, thank you. And that, that helped. <laughs> That helped a lot. Okay, let's say goodbye to you. And yeah, but if anyone has any good Swift recommendations, um, I'd love to hear them. But I am considering the, cra the, the Crazy Monkey Creations. They have one, it will look a lot like this. It's, it doesn't have a motor and it's a Swift instead of being a skein winder. Um, you can wind skeins onto a Swift. You could set the Swift at a size and wind something onto it manually. Um, but they have one that basically has like a Swift on either side. So that way you could go from that to this. And I think that that is cool. The, uh, the one downside I have to this, well, I guess, so I had to assemble it myself, which actually was pretty easy. One downside was that the instructions that it comes with and you can see it here. Um, I think it's for an older version of the skein winder. So although it still works, the button looks different from the button I have. Um, the back wheel looks different from the one that I have. And so um, I was still able to put it together, but there were a few things that looked a little different. And so that made, um, that could make it confusing for someone. Um, the other, the other problem is, um, so I, if it came and I think that the, the wood, it's not like bare wood, it's been treated or finished with some kind of oil and the oil has like a, a citrusy sort of scent to it, which isn't a problem per se, unless you're sensitive to smells. So like after we opened it, like Keith couldn't smell it anymore and I, I still can. So um, that was just is something else to keep in mind. I'm not sure the kind of oil um, that it is, but you could see it like it was all wrapped, packaged really well in paper and stuff. You could see like the oil on the paper. Um, so, okay, let's try the blank. I'm going to move over here. And so this is where it could really be a time saving device for me. Because you've seen me 
in the sock blank special and whatnot. Um, just want to make sure I'm unraveling on the side that it will unravel. Um, you've seen me do this and know that um, it takes time. <laughs> All right, let's do one here. Because if this works, this is a game changer. Let's do a larger um, So there's a notch. Oh, I'll show you guys the notch. Um, okay. So see, there's like a notch in here that's a measurement, which I do wish that these were marked, but now with the tape measure trick, I know that I can just check it. But so you line up a notch on here with a notch there. So that actually makes it pretty easy to manage. Um, wait, I missed a... You've never used sock links before. What's the advantage of using them? Ah, so the advantage of a double strand sock blank is that you can end up with two identical um, skeins of yarn. So if you want to do like socks or something, you could end up with identical, um, you can make identical pairs of socks with it. Um, and I per you can make your own sock blanks um, I have some videos where I've done that with various knitting machines, um, various like toy hand crank knitting machines. And actually I can grab one of those. Um, here's my favorite one for making my own blanks. This is the loops and threads knitting machine from Michaels. Um, but then you can unravel them and you get like a really cool it's a great way to make a gradient um, and then there can also be some speckling and stuff so this one isn't super wild um, but when yeah if you were you could knit directly from this and do two at a time socks but you'll get like a matched pattern which um, is pretty fun okay I'm a little nervous about this um, can, if I sit this way can everyone see Hello, hello. Okay. I am, so you're not, if when you're going really fast because of rope burn and stuff, you are not supposed to hand guide it. But I am hand guiding because um, I am hand guiding because I think that's what I need to do for a soft blank. But the thing is you can't like stop it with your hands. You have to stop it with the button. So I'm trying not to grab. Let me, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Tried for the first time live. Okay. So once it starts, it starts really fast. Oh. Okay, I got nervous. Okay, I do not think I can keep my hand in there. I think I just got to let it go and just watch it. <laughs> um, okay, this isn't bad so far. I don't know if you guys can see. Maybe I can go a little faster. Okay, but that's nice. If I get nervous, I can just slow down. So, so far, we're getting through the blue portion. Now, this would not work as well on one of my homemade blanks, because usually the two strands are twisted together more. So one of the benefit of a commercial blank, um, like one of these, is that it unravels really, really seamlessly. Um, Oh my gosh, this is going to mean that I can do so many more blanks. I mean, I'm definitely not going the fastest speed. And I'm going to slow down. Oh. oh, hey, that did awesome. That did amazing. Um, <laughs> that did amazing. 
amazing. Um, I am very impressed. I'm, I'm going to unplug it just for safety. Um, cue the music from Frozen. <laughs> um, oh, that was great. That was amazing. So I think if you watch any of my live streams, I've done a lot of live streams where I've unraveled these blanks because it can take a little while and I have enough attention so that way I can chat with you. But previously what I was doing was this. And so the difference is just night and day. Um, I think it would be more difficult with a homemade blank. And the other issue that I see is that we do not see um, the, like, I share pictures a lot on Instagram and stuff of like my gradients wound onto these. And so winding them really wide before I scrunch them back up, you can really see what the color progressions are. And here you can see a bit, like if I pull it out a little bit, but it's not as clear of a picture. Now, some people can look at the blank and get a sense like, okay, it's gonna have a bluer section, a purpler section, a bluer section, and a purpler section and where the pinks are. But um, yeah, I know some people, and one of the reasons why I unravel blanks a lot, some people have trouble translating the blank into what it could look like as yarn and then into what it could look like as something created. But um, I think that this is amazing. And I have never had such an easy time unraveling a blank in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I have unraveled when I did the sock blank special in February, I dyed what 20 blanks or so and a combination of single stranded and double stranded blanks. And I did live streams every day and then it took a whole other week for me to unravel everything. And there was probably just as much unraveling live streaming as there was dying live streaming. And so this, will make the unraveling a breeze. I think that there are times when I have a blank that is maybe a little more wild. I might still, or a homemade one, I might still have, want to unravel it by hand. Because if, like, the thing that gets scary is like when a knot sort of jams on here. But, man, I could dye like a whole pile of blanks and then just boom, boom, boom take care of them. This is great. Um, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so again, like, is this something that every home dyer needs to own? No. If I was going to recommend for people who wanted to unravel their blanks before knitting with them, I'd recommend a PVC pipe nitty knotty. Again, like under 10 bucks. Um, and you can easily adjust the size. It's lightweight. It's really easy to store. Um, you can get it wet. Um, there's many, many benefits to this. Um, I have a feeling that some single ply yarns might not work well on here. It could be too much tension. Um, but yeah, there's a great potential here. Um, certainly, you know, you're not, you're not going to use this. Um, there's some applications when it wouldn't help. Like if you're doing self striking yarn and you made like a 10 foot, 10 foot, that's not that big. Um, if you made like a, five, 10 yard skein, you're not gonna really be able to wind that onto here. You're gonna need to do something a little more manual. But I think that if you wanted to create mini skeins or skein yarn off of cones, um, there's many applications like that that um, you could do. And so this was 106. Okay, so let's, let's do a little math. Um, so it's 106 times two. So that's saying it's 212 yarns, uh, 212 yards for each one approximately. And I know that stroll is 462 yards. So not quite. Wait, what did that say? 106? Yeah, so it's not quite counting up to the yardage that should be in here and I didn't weigh it, but um, yeah, I think, I'm not sure, like, 
how I feel about it in terms of like measuring the length, but I think that being able to do the counter. And so if I know like, okay, five grams is 22 wraps, then that's the kind of thing that would start to become really helpful. Because even winding mini skates, if I had it on the Swift, um, you could do it without taking it off with the triple. You could wind first onto the back one and then go two and three before like moving it and taking them off. So then you could take three off at a time. And so I have a feeling that as I am prepping your Hanukkah sampler packages, that that's what I'm going to be doing. And if that goes well, then that'll mean that we could do more samplers in the future and more mini skeins. I mean, sometimes it's hard to dye a beautiful skein of yarn and cut it up into mini skeins. But I like the thought of more people being able to touch, feel, swatch, and play with some of these yarns. Because I think that um, the most frequent question I get or most frequent request is to show a swatch of the yarn at the end of the videos. And the reason why I don't do that is for the biggest reason is just time. Um, I, I think in the last year since, or in the last like nine months, I've probably dyed 200 different colorways or more, something like that. And so, you know, the time, like I don't have a knitting machine that would have a good gauge for a lot of things. And so it would be really hard for me to do that. Not to mention that the color pattern that you get on a you know four inch square is going to be very different from what you might get in the round on a hat or if you had a five inch square or a ten inch square in terms of pooling or not pooling and so unless it's something like a, a, it can be hard to visualize how it'll work until you try it with your gauge on your needles um, and I, I mean, if I could show an example of a finished project in every yarn, I absolutely would. Um, but the main reason is just the time. Um, <laughs> it would make it hard. And not to mention that it would mean that I'd have to cut the ties on the skeins in order to swatch and then retie them. And so that's something else. Um, try a homemade blank before you say you probably won't, but just do it slowly. Um, yeah, some single ply might not be able to handle the tension. Yes, I'll probably try it. Um, but I do know that the double, like I would try a homemade single stranded blank. No problem, I would try that. The double stranded blanks that I've made, even with the best intentions, the two strands twist around each other. And I worry that there would be too much tension and the yarn could break and that it would like snag. And so, but maybe going slow, it would be okay. Um, and so, yeah, I think that I think that that could be okay. But, um, yeah, I think that this is a neat little contraption. And I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna swap the camera and bring you guys back over. Um, although my bright blue wall in the living room might be blowing things out a bit, but you can see. So there were some questions about the sock blank. So this yarn is, um, those pink splatches translate into some speckles. And there is some solid-ish color in here, but I would call even that blue over there a semi-solid. There's a little bit of modeling, or you can get a lot of modeling. You can do a light coverage of a color to get something that looks a lot more speckled. Um, but, you know, having like a pink splotch will lead to pink in multiple rounds a little bit, and um, I think it's pretty. So this isn't quite the same as having, you know, it all out wide, but I think that this is somewhat representative of the color progression. And then I'll be going and editing this video together shortly. Um, I'm not sure what the tensile strength of this yarn is. Um, uh, oh, that's not where the camera goes. <laughs> I haven't tried that, but yeah, I, I, I'm i impressed. I'm really, really impressed with this skein winder. I'd take the yarn off right now, but I kind of, for the video that this is part of, I want to film it on the Nitty Naughty before I remove it, um, just to talk about it. And so that's why I didn't take it off. That's why I did the skein first, so that way I can show it. 
Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about, um, I, I only really make challah, so that's the only bread I can really say anything about, but. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me today to meet the newest member of the Chemnitz family. I would love to hear um, some suggestions of names. Um, although, huh, maybe I'll have to go like in the Tamora Pierce um, vein because in my, so my, my spinning wheel, her name is Sandry. Um, for a character who, in a book, whose, like, magic is displayed through, like, spinning and weaving. <laughs> and so, you know, I could name this after another character. Um, yeah, I'll have, I'll have to think, um, on what a good name for her would be. But, um, yeah, I'd also love some suggestions. I think that that would be really fun. And um, thank you guys so much for, for joining me. And yeah, I th think that this was, this tool, like it's something that I, I could get by without it, but I did really want to uh, celebrate, as you guys know, the anniversary, we're in the anniversary month of, like it's been a year since the Die Pot Weekly Kickstarter campaign was going on. And so I, you know, it's fun to, to go, Go for it. Um, would I consider consider sharing my challah bread recipe? Yes. Um, ooh, Aurora is a good thought. Um, uh, yeah, I think I might have my challah recipe on. I had a short lived cooking blog called Chem Eats. <laughs> um, it might be on there, um, but otherwise, I'll I'll try to find it and I can share that at some point. Um, maybe in the if I remember in the weekly roundup, but yeah, there's just, I'm really, really grateful for the community. Um, I interacting with all of you, being able to ask for recommendations, have you guys join me as I'm trying new things. Um, and yeah, I think that it's been, it's really been a journey and I have some things planned. Um, some things planned. I know that some of the big requests for celebrations are an official dialogue and I am working on something. And so for that, um, make sure that you follow me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm at Chemnitz on Instagram and I'm Chemnitz on uh, Facebook because I'll probably, well, I'll, I always announce everything here as well, but I'll probably share the inspiration pictures and stuff over there. And then the other thing that I did is to celebrate the Kickstarter. Um, and so Die Pot Weekly's birthday is the last that was started on the last day of the Kickstarter, the day that the campaign ended. And so that's the official birthday of Die Pot Weekly. October 18th, it's gonna be a Thursday. Uh, the kids are home with me that day, so I can't do a live stream, but um, I think that maybe on that Friday we'll have some kind of fun live stream. I know you guys really loved when I did the mystery colors that I picked out and dip dyed. So maybe there'll be something like that again. Uh, but for now, I do have something special in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy store and it's mystery surprise yarn. And so I sort of wanted to recreate the most popular reward from the Kickstarter campaign. And yes, yeah, starting at $25, which includes shipping within the US, you can get a mystery skein of yarn that has been dyed in one of the past or upcoming videos. And I can pop that link, and of course I have to bend down awkwardly to do this. Um, in the chat, it's in the, it's also in the um, iCard, in the iCard up there and in the video description. Um, Ooh, mystery colors using acid dyes. Well, I think the one that was requested next was to use the color right drops. Um, but I do, I, I have, you guys saw the unboxing. I have a lot of new acid dye colors that I need to open up and play around with. And actually, um, I am, yeah, I've got something fun planned for the next, uh, I've got a sponsored episode of Dye Pot Winkly and I, 
winking to the person um, <laughs> coming up and I've got something really exciting planned. Um, so, woohoo, we've got your card coming tomorrow. But yeah, I, I think that there's just a lot of fun videos coming up. I forget. I totally forget what video is coming up tomorrow morning. I do not remember what tomorrow's Die Pot Weekly is, but you guys should stay tuned. And yeah, check out, check out the, yeah, if you want to bring home some of the yarn that I've dyed. I mean, this, this one is in the shop and this one is going to turn into an elephant for Lucas because um, he dyed it himself. But uh, yeah, if you want to bring some yarn home, it's a great way to support the channel and everything going on. Um, yeah, so the, <laughs> I shared a video yesterday, sort of like an update on my acid dye stock solutions. And I think going forward, I might not make the stock solutions. I think that I might mix what I want from the powder when I need it. Um, the stock solutions all exhausted well and nine months later, which is probably a little longer than you should keep them. Um, it's doing great, but I think that things that were mixed really well while the water was hot didn't always necessarily stay very well mixed all the way through. And I don't think that I like mixed them thoroughly as I was pouring it out. So for some of the colors and the most notable one is the, Wilt it was, not the Wilton's Violet, the Jacquard Violet. Um, it was way more intense towards the bottom than the top. And I found that out because I tried to replicate um, a yarn that I had dyed in an episode and the purple was way more intense. Beautiful, not a dupe for what I was trying to recreate, which if it was a true stock solution, it should have been, had more of a consistent coloration. But also um, I do, I have heard of ways that you can, things that you can add to your stock solutions to help with the solubility. Um, the Jacquard Sun Yellow, uh, when I first mixed it and it cooled, it turned to like a jelly. <laughs> it was odd. And then that one was never in solution well. So that one I knew wouldn't be consistent color wise, but um, yeah, the, I think that it's just, like a solubility thing. And so I think ultimately, if you are playing with color and, oh, the other issue I had recently was I mixed, I used some of the blue and I added some yellow and I got this really nice um, greenish blue, not quite a green, or but kind of like in the teal family. When I added it to the hot water, it went way more blue. And I think because there were particles in solution, so that way when I dipped even with the yellow not being well mixed, when I dipped the paper towel into the little bit of dye that I had mixed, it looked more green because those like extra blue particles hadn't dissolved yet. And it ended up not being an issue because I wasn't, like I could have added more yellow if I needed to into the pot, um, but it's just something to keep in mind. And so that's why I decided to go ahead and film um, just like a, an update on the stock solutions, but I haven't, I've only made stock solutions once on one day and I've just still been, I've been using those for all the acid dyeing videos for months now. So I think that um, I don't, probably don't have the best advice on how to fix things. I know that I think urea is something that can be used to help um, adjust it. Um, yeah, so and I think that, so the, the colors that the, the dyes look in the bottle don't necessarily translate to the colors that they might look like on the yarn once they're heat set. But uh, yeah, I think that like, so the, the Jacquard Jet Black has a brown hue to it, but if you let all of the dye exhaust or like all the dye absorb, then it is more of a, like a, tr it feels less brown. So sometimes if the color doesn't seem quite right, make, waiting until everything absorbs can help, but sometimes the hues might just be a little off. Um, do I keep records of your color so you can repeat the colorways? If so, can you tell anyone how this can be done simply? Um, I think that, so the records that I keep are these videos. <laughs> and then if you look at all of, 
at least with all the videos in the last year, in the video description, I do put out the, this is how much I used of each color. Um, and then this is how much like, you know, if I had, if I had something that I did measure, I will put that in the video description as well. Um, so that way, and so that's sort of my personal dye notebook. But I think that um, some people will do cards and they'll like, for if they're mixing colors, they'll have like the proportions and then they'll have a snip of the yarn. Um, I think you could do like a, like you could do a photo, like a photo album and on like four by six cards, write your recipes, have a snip and then slide them in and out of pockets. Um, there's another, oh, another idea um, for having like shades and colors was, you know those um, embroidery floss boxes and bobbins? You could wrap some yarn around one of those bobbins to be the color and then either have like a recipe on there or have like a number designation to take you to a notebook as a way to organize the, the colors um, and, and the recipes. Um, but I, my approach for now is mostly let's see what we can get and let's throw stuff together versus let's repeat this exact color um, so I don't have like, like a notebook of colors, like, like if people who have like a, the, like a big or even a small shop frequently will have a binder or something of the colors that they have with swatches of those colors. Um, so that way when they meet with like a local yarn store or something for like a wholesale customer, then they can talk a little bit about the colors. Um, Chicard says it may take up to three ounces of dye to get a true black on one pound of fiber. Yeah, I think that the... I've definitely gotten a true black, but I haven't tried to dye, um, you know, a whole skein black, just like portions. And so using like hand painting with the 1% stock solution was sufficient to get black on a portion. Um, but I'm not sure, I don't remember the like, the amount of dye to fiber type ratio for that. Um, but yeah, for some of those deep colors, you need a lot. Just like um, Jacquard Fire Red, which when saturated gives this beautiful, beautiful, um, it's almost, for me, it was a bit of like almost a bluish red. It wasn't purple, but it was gorgeous. But if you are not that saturated, then it absolutely reads pink. Um, and very, in the same pink family as Jacquard Pink, actually, um, at least in my experience. But um, I do know that some colors can shift from batch to batch um, from manufacturers or sometimes if the dye powder has been exposed to more humidity, that that can affect um, some of the color a little bit sometimes. So um, there's a group for like indie dyer business owners and some people have, there's a lot of conversations about like, okay, this batch is looking way different from another batch and then people trying to figure out how to deal with that. Um, so yeah, that is uh, <laughs> that aspect, but um, anyway, if you have more questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. I do read the YouTube comments and I try to respond um, as quickly as I can. Um, the, I have a time constraint in that I have a child that will be coming downstairs shortly. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. That's why I really like doing these as live streams because I think that there's a benefit to being able to respond to questions within the video itself. Um, and I also just like the opportunity to chat with you guys um, and to show off our newest friend. <laughs> um, oh, there's a woodworking student. Maybe I should, I think Nia. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm so glad that you guys were able to join me. And yeah, if you want to learn more about this, there's a link to it in the video description, as well as all of my links to various places. And I hope that you all have a fantastic day and yeah, that you have a wonderful, wonderful week and stay tuned for tomorrow morning for a new episode of Dye Pot Weekly. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.